So this morning we're going to hear from Ephesians again. And this is part two of our look at Ephesians that we started earlier this spring. Um, And for those of you who missed the first one, if you weren't here, um, Ephesians is this book in the Bible that has somehow made its way into the life of our church over the last couple years and in our leadership team meetings and in our women's group, and in our Advent reflections. And so we thought we would intentionally host Ephesians as a community um, and see what it has to speak to us in this season. And it's, um, it's proving with all the many things that are going on in our community to be quite fruitful. And I'm going to recap what we talked about last time. But before I do that, um, I just wanted to start with the prayer that we left off with last time, and it's the prayer that Paul prays for the Ephesians in the third chapter of Ephesians. So, For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Jesus through all generations forever. Amen. There is a bountiful and spaciousness to this prayer. There's an abundance in these words that Paul is offering us. It's like Paul is throwing out word after beautiful, evocative word in the hopes of carving out a space within each of us, a spaciousness for this beyond comprehension love. And we find that the truth of this prayer and the truth of this life that we live with God is not located in our effort or our ability, but it's actually located in God's plentitude. And in a time like Paul's, which maybe is a little bit like a time like ours, Um, where truth was decided by whoever really had the most money and the power to enforce it. And in a time like Paul's, and maybe a little bit like ours, where real people um, were suffering deeply because of forces completely out of their control. And in a time like Paul's, and maybe a little bit like ours, uh, where the common vision of God has been diminished to this box of rules and fears and ins and outs, um, here comes a prayer designed to blow all of that away and reveal the truth, this huge horizon that has always been behind our lives, and to reveal the depths and abundance of love that our life, this life together that we all came here today for, is really rooted in. So would that this prayer do that for us today? And this is the ground that we, we start everything with that we're going to talk about today. So a couple months ago, we started looking at the book of Ephesians, and we took this big view of the letter Paul wrote, visiting a few verses that, that just demonstrated the scope of God's vision and action. And importantly, we saw that for Paul and the, in the early church, the inbreaking of God's kingdom was God's work, um, not our work. It was flowing from his abundance, and that we, who have somehow, somewhere along the line, been caught by his person or caught by his grace or caught by his presence, we are invited to both witness to it and participate in it. And so we're called to be part of this reunion or part of this remembering. I like that, remembering of the world by pointing to it when we see it and then acting within its scope. So if you remember, we looked at this passage in chapter 1. For he made known to us the mystery of his will, which he purposed in Christ, to bring unity to all things in heaven and earth under Christ. Remember how all-encompassing this unity was. God is bringing you into unity with yourself, you into unity with others, with your people around you, with your neighbors, with people you maybe don't like so much, with your world. And then you and me and all of us are being brought into unity with him, and none of these unities are exclusive of the other. They are all connected, and they're all part of God's big vision. This wholeness is how we were intended to move through the world. And then we looked at a passage in chapter 2 where Paul writes that because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, 
made us alive with Christ even when we are dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. While we were dead, that is while we were completely unable to respond, because that's what being dead is, God did the work of grace. God did the work of dying and being reborn in Jesus like a second Adam, repatterning the very DNA of the world. And not only that, Paul goes on in chapter 2, but his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body, his own body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Through the sacrifice of Jesus, he's destroying the dividing wall of hostility among us. He's rebuilding one new humanity out of all these divided bits of us. And then we looked at chapter 3, where Paul writes that most outlandish verse in Scripture, according to me, that it is through the church that God's wisdom is made known, and not his singular wisdom. But Paul uses the word manifold wisdom, so manifold, multifaceted, many-voiced wisdom. He is doing this work of reunion through completely ordinary nut jobs, like each of us, and through the hard and scary, honest work of real live relationships. And he is accomplishing this huge, cosmos-shifting work in Paul's imagination of reconciling all things back together through the true fact of you and you and you and us all sitting together in this room, sitting in these rows next to each other. And you know my response to that. <laughs> it's always, how could this possibly be? And as I was thinking about this this week, I realized I'm in, a, I'm in good company as the latest in a long line of, of biblical and historical witnesses who look at the work of God and go, how could this possibly be? But we can observe that Paul, listening to the Holy Spirit, is convinced that the work of God is located here in real situations and in real life and in real relationships. This is a very incarnated, very fleshy, very earthly faith we are a part of. We are his household, Paul says, his temple, the place where he lives. And we, the church, the people of God, we are the building materials of God's dwelling. So men and women and children and relationships and all that it is to live as a human are the material he makes his home out of, living stones. How could this be? And it's within this vision this imagining of God's work that Paul gives us his therefores. He gives shape to what this looks like in, in our real lives. He starts his instructions like this. In chapter 4, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. This calling Paul is talking about is living with a God who's bringing all things into unity, who's removing the walls of hostility, using his manifold wisdom to reconcile the earth. That's the calling. And to live a life worthy of that calling, the first things for Paul are to be humble, to be gentle, to be patient, to bear with each other. It's remarkable that what's critical to living this huge vision out is not having the right opinion or the right morality, or the right stance on issues. It's not how to market and save souls even. It's not even how fervent we are or devoted we are. For Paul, in this passage, the way we live this calling out is found in how we go about dealing with other humans, with each other, with the people in your row. And maybe you notice this too as you've read Ephesians over the last few weeks, but Paul's instructions in chapters 4, 5, and 6, they're overwhelmingly relational instructions. You'll find that a lot in the New Testament. They concern themselves with how we are with other people and how we respond in real human relationships. And for being written thousands of years ago, they are incredibly insightful and incredibly relevant and incredibly challenging. So let's just take a look at some of these instructions Paul's giving. So in chapter 4, we have the be humble, be gentle, be patient, bear with one another in love, or bear one another in love. We have don't be false, speak truthfully to your neighbor. When you are angry, do not sin. It's not don't be angry, it's when you are angry, 
Do not add to the brokenness, right? Do not steal from one another, but instead do something useful with your hands so that you have something to share. Do not talk unwholesomely, but only say what builds up others. What if we only said what builds up others? We'd probably be a lot more quiet. <laughs> get rid of bitterness. Get rid of slander. Get rid of malice. Um, I'm greatly... I'm a political junkie. I like to read the news, and holy smokes, these are speaking to the world of the internet these days, right? Be kind, be compassionate to one another. Forgive each other as you have been forgiven. Do what God does and walk in the way of love. And in chapter 5, he's written, there's to be no sexual immorality, no greed or impurity. It's so interesting to me that impurity and immorality are intricately bound up with greed in Paul's view. There's no obscenity, no foolish talking, no coarse joking. Live as children of the light. Do not get drunk on wine, but instead speak to each other in songs and psalms and with beautiful words. And when we read all of these things, we get to ask why, because we get to use our, our critical brains and we ask why. Why is living these ways important? Why is coarse joking included in this? How do these things implement this vision. And I think it's because how we joke and how we speak and how we contribute to the good and share with the community and how we deal with conflict and anger, how we engage in physical love, all of these things have the capacity to build up or to diminish one another's humanity. How we live with others and how we safeguard each other's dignity as creations of God has everything to do with living a life worthy of this calling of a God who is bringing all things back into unity. So all of these do's and don'ts that Paul writes, here and in other places in the New Testament, they're all ways of participating in God's work of restoration. So I guess the question for us is which are sticking out to you this morning? This could be just a question you take home to reflect on, or as you've read Ephesians in these last few weeks, which ones are maybe a little bit pointed <laughs> for you? or for me. I know um, as I've been sitting it with this week, I've been pierced a little bit by, by the bitterness one. <laughs> there are things and people and words that were said that I am still bitter about from decades ago. And what is it doing to my humanity and to my own wholeness to hold on to this bitterness? And what is it doing to the humanity of others when I refuse to see them in any light other than this one? And I'll tell you what it's not doing. It's not participating in bringing everything into restoration. So I'm sitting with God, and I'm letting him see that. And is there something maybe that you are being invited to sit down and look at him with? Now, we get to the next passage, my favorite passage in, in Scripture, one where Paul gives further instructions on how to participate in this vision. Are you ready? Ephesians 5, 22, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. It's good. It's a good one. I love it. Um, <laughs> my husband's eyebrows like, mm. <laughs> This verse is, is one of a few that Paul wrote that, that have the potential mm, to be destructive in people's lives. Let's just name that. <laughs> and it has that potential if we forget that the vision has to be come before the implementation. That's if we forget to read these passages with that cardinal rule of Bible reading, which is to interpret the parts in light of the whole. So that one rule serves us so well when we're reading scripture and seeing our own uh, 21st century lives by its light. So yes, in verse 22 it says, wives, submit to your husbands because he is the head of you. But if we read the part in the light of the whole, we pan out to the verses before and behind it, and we read in verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then in verse 25 and 28, we read, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And husbands, love your wives as you, as you love your own body, for you are members of one body. Well, that's a totally different picture. And then if we remember to pan out further, we know that this bit of instructions nestled in this passage about how to live a life worthy of the calling. And then if we pan out further, we see that the calling, <laughs> we remember that calling, right? To witness and participate in God bringing everything into unity, 
destroying the walls of hostility between people and using the multi-voiced nature of community to do it, we submit to each other, Brad and I, within that vision. I can get behind that. <laughs> he submits to me because of my createdness and what I have to offer, and I submit to him out of his createdness and who God is in him. And not only does Paul call out the mutuality of the husband and wife relationship in this passage, he also does the same thing with the parent-child relationship. So children obey your parents, but parents don't exasperate your children. Teach them, walk alongside them. He does the same thing with the master-slave relationship. Slaves obey your masters and serve them wholeheartedly, but masters also treat your slaves kindly and in the same way because truly you both have a master in heaven and he has no favorites. Paul saw that in our real lives there are power imbalances that lead, that could lead and do lead to a destroying disunity. And these three relationships in Paul's time really demonstrate this clearly. Wives and children and slaves had zero power, zero legal rights in that culture, zero recourse to the benefits of a good human life if they happen to be in a, in a bad relationship, right? And here was this early Christian declaring that in order to live a life with God, there had to be an evening out of that power. There must be a mutuality, a deliberate handing over of power from one to another, from top to bottom, and from bottom to top. And that's what's revolutionary about that. That's why the early church had such an appeal. That's why you have slaves eating with landowners and men eating with women, and sex trade workers eating with powerful merchants, powerful CFOs. So how, how are we living this out? How do we live this out in our everyday life? And so just a little thought exercise you could take with you. Think of your day yesterday. Where were you yesterday? What did you do? Who were you with? And who came across your path? Was there a moment yesterday of mutuality, of handing over of power, of being humble and gentle and patient or bearing one another from you to others or from others to you. Because wherever that happened yesterday, that is where the inbreaking of God's kingdom, God's way of doing things, his vision, his dream, his project, that's where it happened in our world yesterday. So this last passage that we're going to look at this morning, and it's back at the beginning of chapter 4, and it gives us a framework for all of this. And it's a long passage, so just get comfortable. I'll read it out. <laughs> I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. So Christ himself gave the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the pastors and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and we become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Here is the path that leads us to maturity and strength, personally and in a community. Here's the path that leads us to a grounded, deeply rooted kind of community that's not easily tossed back and forth. With this passage, Paul is talking about unity, but it's a unity not founded on sameness, but unity through the choice to work together with all of our differences as a body. We all are different expressions of God in this world with different giftings, 
backgrounds and ideas, and we are unified by our vision of bringing it all together in wholeness. This is not a small footnote um, to Paul's understanding of this calling and the work of the resurrected Christ. This is a huge, huge insight into human communities and specifically human communities following a God of manifold wisdom and resurrected power. The power to make life come from death and to make growth come from conflict and to make unity come through diversity, that kind of power. We, as the church, we are to embrace and make room and celebrate each other's divergent talents and callings, which, by the way, will make us have to mitigate our differences and do that hard work of honest communication, which I don't, <laughs> which is hard. <laughs> we will always have to deal well with the inevitable conflict and differences of opinion and stance and life experience that is the natural result of just being different minds and different bodies. But the more we do this, the more we will not be tossed around by waves. We will not be easily swayed or obsessed by trendy church growth promises or charismatic but vapid leaders. The more we will avoid the temptation of our culture to consume over Jesus' giving away the more we will no longer be liable to leave relationships because they start to challenge our worldview and pry open our safe understandings, and maybe the more we will be safe to stay in relationships even when we know ourselves to be different. The more we practice welcoming and working through with those that are different and designed different by God from us, the more we will leave behind our self-focused and acquisitive tendencies because we will start to see through the eyes of the other. The only way, Paul is saying, that we are start to mature in this long walk with God together, the only way is when we take our cue from how God does it, when he points some for this and some for that and some for this and some for that, and embrace the differences in experience and abilities to more fully express the whole of who God is. How we engage with one another is so important And that's why Paul spends so much time on it in the New Testament, because we are what comprise his actual body through the Spirit. How we do this, how we remember each of each other's hearts and good createdness, how we choose to be responsible for our own selves and our own response, how we choose to work in a body and not demand that we all be the same. This is how we will even start to grow into maturity transforming into the living heart of God and be used as the building blocks of God's living presence in this world. This is how God shows to the powers and principalities of this world that there is a different way to be human. Live a life worthy of the calling, Paul writes. Be completely humble, gentle, patient, bearing, holding, supporting, bringing to life one another in love. And it's a disrupting, not business as usual, abundant, surpassing knowledge kind of love. So we start and we end, along with every other human we see, with how wide and how long and how high and how deep is this love for us. This is the vision imagined by Paul not in the abstract, but in the very real, concrete details of our lives. John Lewis is a pretty influential civil rights activist in the States. Uh, He's a congressman now, and he writes about the beloved community. That was a rallying point in the civil rights movement in the 60s, the beloved community. So people who were oppressed and had no, (laughs) who were not treated as their humanity should have said they should be treated they chose to focus on the beloved community. He asks a what if question, as in what if the beloved community were already a reality, the true reality, and he simply had to embody it until everyone else could see it. He says, I've discovered that what, that you have to have a sense of faith that what you are moving towards is already done. You have to live as if the beloved community were already a reality. How are we the beloved community to each other? How are we the beloved community that is already a reality and already being shaped into the dwelling place of God? 
Where is that belovedness already occurring? Where does it want to fill out next in our community, our community in here and our community out there? Where do we embody it until everyone can see it? How do we live as if God is already reuniting everything in Christ? That's the question we, all of you holy souls here today, at this church, and this church even in the wider sense, we choose to wrestle with over and over as we change and we grow ourselves. So Paul ends this letter of Ephesians with a powerful piece of prose. It's the armor of God passage. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities and powers of this dark world and the spiritual forces of evil. Paul is reminding us again that we are not fighting each other as humans. We are not each other's enemies. But anything that would seek to destroy God's creation, destroy the diverse unity he has made, destroy the reconciliation and the reunion of God's world, that is to be rightly called out and stood firm against. Stand firm then, Paul exhorts his readers and us with truth and righteousness, peace and faith and salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And we know that the word of God is the incarnated presence of Jesus. That is what we stand with after everything. God's very word, his incarnated presence, his very body that is bringing all things together, even the parts of it in this room right now. And that is what he is restoring the world with. I'm going to (laughs) pray. And I'm going to just pray the prayer from this last chapter of Ephesians from the message. Strong God, keep us strong. Help us to stand up to everything thrown our way in the life or death fight to the finish against the devil and his angels. Lord, you know that we are up against far more than we can handle on our own. We need all the help we can get, every weapon you have issued, so that when it's all over, we will still be on our feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation are more than words. Work them into the substance of our lives. Your word is an indispensable weapon. Prayer too. Keep us praying hard and long praying for our brothers and sisters, praying with our eyes open, our hearts open, Lord. We don't want anyone to fall behind or drop out. God, the Father, and Jesus, you have mixed love with faith and you've poured it out on us. We live in a world of pure grace and nothing but grace because of you. We love you. Amen.